All right, uh, welcome back everybody. I hope you had a nice lunch. Those of you who had lunch, you're sitting comfortably on your chair. And as you can see on the picture already, our next speaker is somebody that I know for a very, very long time. Actually, the reason I'm here in this conference, uh, he's the author of the book, Perform, The Unsexy Truth About Startup Success. And, uh, and this is the second time in a couple of months that I need to introduce myself on the stage. So I hope I get a bit of a clap here, yes? Yay, <laughs> amazing, amazing, thank you so much. All right, let's not uh, lose any time and just dig into the topic, the unsexy truth about startup success. That's right. How do we perform consistently as a team? And what are the kind of things that make a team work when it comes to startups? Now, how many of you have been entrepreneurs, at least here in the room, and entrepreneurs? Okay, I've been an entrepreneur myself for over 10 years right now from being a video and movie producer and running a digital marketing agency and I've been also organizing exclusive mastermind experiences, team of sites and currently for the last five years working a lot with companies helping them to build more productive and more happy cultures in the organizations. And I love being an entrepreneur. It is awesome, right? When you are an entrepreneur, you're basically your own boss. Right? You, you see the whole picture. You are the person that has the power to connect the dots and, and just envision a bigger future and, and build the products and find the solutions that nobody else had. And, and you go to conferences like Wolf Summit, and you go to the great pitch contest, pitch your company, meet cool people, dress nicely, put all the pictures on Instagram, on TikTok, whatever you guys are using. And it's really cool, right? Now, I met this guy, and we spoke about uh, this company earlier this morning from FinTech OS. Uh, Sergio is a friend of mine. He's a co-founder of FinTech OS. Recently, the guys raised 60 million, and I ask him, what is entrepreneurship for you? What do you think about it? That's what he said. The everyday life of an entrepreneur is digging a muddy trench. There's little, very little glamour. And this is the kind of answer that I get from any successful entrepreneur. We like to talk about unicorns. I like to talk about uh, how cool it is to, to build this amazing tech company. And it is awesome. I think we should all be ambitious. I work with a lot of startups, and when I coach startups, we ask them about, where do you see yourself five years in the future? I'm going to be the leading provider of this. We're going to make an exit to Amazon. All right, amazing. Great to have big ambitions. But how many companies actually make it? What is the chance to actually succeeds as an entrepreneur. Um, we had uh, these uh, great guys yesterday from Startup Genome, and this is one of the statistics from their reports. Less than one out of 10 startups is going to survive. And I want to emphasize on the word survive. We're not talking about building a unicorn. We're talking about making a successful business. We're talking about somebody who has a business that still runs, still survives. Yet we keep talking about the few examples of the super successful unicorn companies or big companies. It takes between 7 to 11 years to, to make an exit, according to data actually coming from the American market. 7 to 11 years on average. And this is in Silicon Valley where the, the infrastructure, everything is so much more developed, right? It is really, really hard. This is what entrepreneurship really is, right? You start your own company, you're basically running into the jungle. Your first task, or your task for the, the first few years, is, is to survive. You need to secure the basics. Right? What are the basics? I need to have the cash flow to keep running. I need to secure a shelter. Now, the jungle is a very abundant place. You can build amazing things. You can thrive in the jungle. 
But this is not the kind of mindset that you, you enter the jungle with. Your mindset is, I, I need to survive. I need to adapt to this environment. I need to align myself with the right kind of people around me. Right? I need to build a team of, of, of trusted partners, and we have to grow in this environment. We need to find product market fit. We need to find sustainable cash flows in order for us to be able in a few years potentially to build something meaningful, right? This gentleman here, uh, Cristobal Alonso, he's going to be uh, joining us on stage tomorrow, one of the, the biggest drivers of the uh, Central European ecosystem. Cristobal Alonso is the CEO of Startup Wise Guys, and he's my co-author. And Startup Wise Guys, by the way, is uh, it's the largest B2B accelerator in, in Europe. They've invested in over 250 companies. Uh, they're doing a lot of programs all around Europe right now. And one interesting thing about Startup Wise Guys, the startups that they've invested in, that are part of their portfolio, they have around 80% survival rate, right? So, so it's, why is it 80%? And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? In order to enter an acceleration program, of course, the teams that are selected are already having some traction, they're really good in some things. There's a lot of good mentoring around the important areas like how to get investment, how to build a product, sales, marketing, and so on, but, but what else is there? What is something that we don't talk about so often, which is super, super important? We had a lot of these conversations with Cristobal. Uh, I've been working with the wise guys coaching their startups for the, for the past five years. And Cristobal is a big promoter of culture. Developing team culture. A and I myself, I'm all about culture, all about productivity and performance. So uh, back in 2018, we decided to embark on a journey and explore what are the best companies in the region, the region we call New Europe, what are they doing on top of all the things that I mentioned, sales, marketing, product, and so on. What are they doing in order to build a sustainable team that performs consistently at the top of the ability? And since you guys who are founders, who are running startups, you're very, very busy just like we are, we decided to make it really, really simple and created this framework which has been successfully applied now by over 300 companies, primarily in Europe, startups. Uh, and this is a, a way to simplify it for all of you. What are the most important areas that sometimes get neglected? Purpose and values. Why do you do what you do? Is anybody from, everybody from the team clear why do you do what you do? What are the kind of values and principles that you're sharing with your team? Is everybody aligned around what's the culture? Effective planning, my favorite area. How do you plan? What are your processes and methods to, to set goals? To set up the strategy? How often do you go to a strategy session, strategy offsite? And, and what kind of method do you use? Do you track and measure these things? And how do you bring that into the day-to-day -day so you maximize your time as a team? First of all, your, your time as a leader, as a founder, but secondly, the time of the team, teaching people to take ownership. Roles and responsibilities, the most neglected area. Everybody knows what's the role. Oh, of course, man, I, I'm the CMO, I'm the marketing person, and she's the CEO. Yeah, but what do you do? I don't care about your marketing executive. What do you exactly do? Is everybody clear who's responsible for the specific projects and specific things? And do we put passion into the equation? Are we splitting the roles and responsibilities across what people are good at? Or do we actually include what do people love to do as well? Focus on execution. It's great to be planning, right? Set up the goals, set up the targets and objectives. But at the end of the day, you've got to get shit done. 
You gotta stay focused on the few things that really matter. And it's really, really difficult when there are so many demands, so many new ideas, so many new markets and potential customers. Optimal energy. This one, almost everybody knows all this stuff, but at the same time is, is sometimes going down. What does that mean? Optimal energy, the well-being, mentally, physically, emotionally. How well do you take care of yourself? How will build a culture where you, your, the people from your team, they pay attention to their energy on a consistent basis, sleeping well, eating well, taking breaks, taking care of their mental health. You have the structures to make it cool, to create the space for people to, to be in their optimal energy state. Robust communication. How do you communicate internally? Is it efficient? Now, we live in a global pandemic time, right? Communication has been really hardened in the last couple of years. Many people work from home, but even before that, how frequently do you communicate with your team? Do you give feedback constructively? And do you allow people, because you're the boss, do you allow people to to be safe to tell you when things are not going well. So how effective is our internal communication? And then finally, mental toughness. Our capability to deal with stressors. You're running your company, you're dealing with uncertainty every single day. How do you manage stress? How do you decrease the amount of stress in the company, in the team? But then how do I increase the capability of myself and the team to manage stress better, to get back on track when, when shit hits the fan, to keep your balance and, and be focused on the things that matter, focus on the things, the solutions. So, so these are the seven areas. Today I'm going to cover some of these and I want to give you some uh, practical ideas and tools that you might be able to use. But in any case, make sure to get back to this framework and ask yourself, where are we not doing things the right way, right? But let's start. Purpose and values. When should we start talking about purpose and values? Really, really good question. Well, your purpose and your values and your culture is your operating system. You might like uh, Windows, you might like Mac, you might like whatever. They, this, by the way, these things are all working. They function properly, but they're really different. What is the kind of culture you want to build? There's, there's many different cultures that are working perfectly fine, but what is the kind of culture that fits your values? And have you had the chance to discuss with your co-founders, with the key people from your team, hey, what do we stand for, guys? What are the kind of things that we want to be known for? What is the kind of vibe and energy we want to have in the team? What are the things that we value the most, that matter most to us? So when we take decisions, they're going to be based around our values, around our principles. This guy is from the region, a very successful guy. And many of you have heard about this company, Miro. Uh, one of the guys we interviewed for the book. And I asked him this same question. When is the time to start talking about culture and values? That's what he said. Day one is the right time to start deciding on values and crafting the culture you want your startup to have. Day one. Doesn't mean you have to have it fully formalized in a beautiful booklet, but you need to have these discussions with your co-founders. What we stand for? Who do we want to be? And this is a very big simplification, but it's a very good starting point, the three pillars of a strong startup culture. Where do we begin these conversations? If you get these three right, it's a very good starting point. So purpose. Why do you do what you do? Why do you wake up in the morning? Why exactly do you want to bring this, this product to the market on top of, hey, there's a good business in it? What excites you about it? What is the kind of difference you want to make to the world with what you do? 
Number two, values, the how. The principles around how do we operate. I'm going to give you some examples so we're going to get more clear around that. Vision. If you close your eyes, what is your boldest vision? Where do you want to be five years in the future, 10 years in the future, 20 years in the future? Have you even asked yourself this question? All right, you're working hard, you're building this thing. What are you leaning towards? Where do you want to be? Because if you don't, want, if you don't know where you're going, you might end up somewhere else, right? How big of a team do you want to grow? What do you want to achieve? What is your vision? Let me give you some examples. This uh, gentleman, uh, as you can see, he's an accountant. He's my accountant. A few years ago, uh, I was looking for a new accountant, and uh, I asked some people. They gave me some references, and, and then I asked, OK, uh, let me check this Klaus guy. I opened his web page, and I see this message. I help small business owners to sleep better at night. Right? That's his purpose. He's not an accountant. Accounting is his tool to serve his purpose. This is his why. I got to tell you, he's been going through very difficult moments himself. Doesn't matter. He's driven. He, that's my purpose. I'm just getting excited about helping the small business owners because I know how much hurdle it is to deal with administration. And he's proven it multiple times to me. Uh, it's not just a smart play of words, right? What is your purpose? Why are you so excited to build exactly this thing? Okay, let me give you an example on a vision. Uh, these guys are creating some sort of bots for the health industry. But then they came up with this. We want to aim to create a world with zero diseases. And maybe, just maybe, we're never going to reach this. But this is what we strive for. This is what we're excited about. This is the vision of the way we want to lead the company. And you can go so much further. So many co-founders never talk about the vision, never talk about what do we want to achieve at the end of the day. OK, values. Let's go to the values. A few uh, very practical tips. I've been interviewing uh, for the book over 50 super successful founders from the region and uh, also maybe hundreds on my podcast. And there are some guidelines. I wouldn't say there's rules when it comes to uh, creating the list of values, but this is a company from uh, Bulgaria. Actually, it's been, it's been awarded twice at the best fintech startup in Bulgaria called FireUp. I interviewed the CEO of the company, Konstantin Jelepov, and what he said is, Values are basically his decision-making tool. In ev every meeting, in every narrative in the company, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to include the value somehow, because that's who we are. We take decisions this way. When we're attracting new people on board, we make sure that they fit our culture, they fit our values. And I only want to have three values. No more than three, because, hey, we're not a huge team. When we have three, it's easy for people to remember. It's super simple, right? I love this one. Proud and humble, a team of quiet achievers. Doesn't that give you a hint about how the guys are acting? If you read a press release, for example, from the company, you probably will know how to go about it, right? So defining the values, it's a really, really important step. Let me give you another example. These guys are from Turkey, a great, uh, a great team, very smiling and positive people. We did a workshop with them, and uh, because they're illustrators, they decided to add also some uh, visuals to the values. Many founders we interviewed, they had a similar approach, because once you define the values, afterwards, uh, you want to have something that uh, is for the left brain and for the right, right brain. People can click and remember it better if, if you also put on some pictures. When you're defining the values, also try and make it a little bit more personal, right? You know, if you language it as honesty, integrity, whatever, like, it could be any, any company. 
But how how you say it, so it, it, it matters. It, it creates some emotional response. So, and it's usually a process. You, you can't just go to a workshop and, and, and nail it. You got to test if you're actually doing it. Uh, I've been building my team in, in the last couple of years. And firstly, we came together. We, we made a workshop, whatever. And we came up with these six values. But then again, do we actually live them? We got to observe what we do. Or, or is it just some smart way to do things? Um, Several months later, I asked the team, what, uh, what for you are the five things that we value the most? Don't look at what we wrote six months ago. What do we really value at the moment? And I was really happy to see that these are three people from my team. The answer was more or less in the same areas. So that could be a way for you to do it as well. Just see it as a process, defining them, crafting them to sound the way they should be. It might take you a bit of time. Um, currently, we came down to only three, and uh, there are some bullet points describing them, and it's a process. But we kind of know what are the things that matter most to us, okay? So, purpose and values, having conversations with your team, super, super important. Um, my favorite area, as I said, effective planning. Where, where are we going? And how do we maximize the resources by going there? Uh, this gentleman is uh, David Allen. Uh, any of you have read uh, GTD, Getting Things Done? Yeah, uh, it's probably the most uh, recognized system for productivity. David, uh, I'm very humbled and honored to, to have him as a friend. Uh, have him on a podcast recently, on my podcast. And um, he likes to say, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. You can do anything you want. You can build any feature you want for your product, but, but you can't do everything at the same time. And let me just see if we can play that. So, so basically, what is the point of productivity at the first place? Why should we put productivity and planning as something that's really important? Let's, let's play this video and see what David has to say. So. Productivity, it's got a lot of baggage to its story. And as you probably know, everybody thinks productivity, oh my God, I have to sweat more, I'm gonna have to work harder, uh, more to do to be more productive, I don't need that. And yet productivity simply means producing what you want. If you go on a vacation to relax and you don't relax, that's an unproductive vacation. You know, if you have a party and you wanna have fun and you don't have fun, that's not a productive party. You know, you wanna cook a nice dinner for your kids or your family and it's not a nice dinner and they don't have fun at all, it's unproductive. So productivity simply means achieving some sort of desired result and that that desired result could be some internal experience of happiness, relaxation, fun, you know, whatever. Productivity is about producing some sort of desired result. David once told me, outcomes and actions are the zeros and ones of productivity, right? You gotta be clear what's the outcome you're after. What's the desired result I want to produce? And then, what are the action steps, the smartest action steps to get there? And this is a process you gotta do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, we are down in a jungle every single day, right? You're hustling, you're getting things done. But once in a while, you're gonna go high up. You wanna get a sense of perspective. And I would say this once in a while should be on a daily basis. Every day, you are climbing the tree to see the whole picture. Every week, you climb the nearby hill to, to, to see things from a bigger perspective. I, every time I do a workshop, there will be one person that will say, Stone, this is so great, but I don't have time to plan my time. I'm just so busy. Of course you're busy, because you haven't taken the time to plan your time. And you focus on all kinds of different things instead of being really focused on the few things that matter. Planning is bringing the future into the present so that you can do something about it now. It's always building things backwards. Right? Where do we want to be a year from now? What's the most important objective three months from now? And then if I build it backwards, how should we focus? What should we do in order for us 
to be on track to achieve these objectives, to achieve these goals. It's not a rocket science. It's the unsexy truth, right? Everybody knows how to do it. But do you do it consistently? Do you consistently sharpen the knife? Do you consistently review the priorities and everybody's on the same page about that? And it starts with prioritizing strategic sessions, prioritizing time for goal setting, prioritizing time for measuring, making it a habit. Do you have a weekly habit of meeting with the team and, and measuring the objectives, measuring the priorities? Now, a very uh, simple system, many people, how many here in the room are using OKRs or know about OKRs? Okay, half of the room here seems to be using them. Uh, for the rest of you, just very quickly, OKRs is something, a system that's been developed and implemented back in the 80s, initially in IBM, but it became really famous and popular uh, since Google started using it and many of the tech companies in Silicon Valley. It stands for objectives and key results. So basically, if you compare it to goals, OKRs are a little bit more structured. So you have an objective, a main objective, and then you have key results which are making it more tangible and concrete. So the objectives are usually, for example, grow our sales in Poland, right? It's just more like a direction. While the key results connected to these objectives clarify it and make it simple for us to know what does it mean that we achieve the objective? Double our sales for the quarter, let's say, since the last quarter. Okay, that's quite measurable. I get that. Uh, usually when you set OKRs, and it's a very good system, well, of course you can do something else, but I would say this is a very simple, useful system. You, you want to pick three, maximum five, but three would be really good. And if you're a bigger team, you can split every department. Just like these guys from a company called IRIM, uh, the fastest growing e-commerce uh, in CEE, according to the founder. Um, they're selling glasses online. They use OKRs for a number of years. Uh, this is a screenshot of, of one of their months. Basically, this is uh, Adriana. Uh, she's in marketing, as you can see. Every department needs to do their OKRs. And by the way, this is a public file. right? Everybody can see this file. This creates accountability. When you commit what are the objectives, you got to deliver. Because at the next meeting, you have to say, hey, what happened? Did we reach this objective? And this is part of what we want to do, right? We want to create culture of accountability. So uh, just an example, OKRs, very good tool, but you can use other tools. Doesn't matter what the method is. It's important that you do it consistently. And then. Defining the quarterly objectives is a really, really good thing, but how do we measure on a monthly basis? A really good example comes from uh, Hungary. This is a company called Talentuno. Uh, and uh, what they do on a monthly basis is they would meet up, and these are the managers. So I think it's a company of 70, 80 people. And every manager, every executive needs to pitch to the rest of the managers what are my top five priorities for the month. And the other managers, they need to confirm and accept and say, okay, you can go with it. Now that creates a couple of things. First of all, you got to get clear because you pitch in front of the people. But then once you commit, you have to deliver, right? And they have this rule of thumb, meaning you have to spend up to 90% of your time and resources on the first five priorities. This is just a guideline. It doesn't have to be your thing, but do you know what your priorities are? As a founder, as a leader. And if I come back here just for a second, the guy with the, with the green, Zolti, he's the co-founder and CEO of the company, super involved in the company. I would say he's working really, really hard. Yet, he's the guy with only three priorities. And when I asked him why, he said, because I know that the fewer the priorities are, the more focused I will be. Something to think about. How many priorities do you have? And are you clear what the priorities of your co-founders and the other people on team are? Do you have an alignment around this? 
sounds super simple, but we don't do it enough. So maybe something you want to do with your team. Sit down and ask them, what is your top three? What is your top five priorities? Oh, that shouldn't be a priority. Maybe we should do some changes. Okay? So moving forward. How do we bring it into the day-to-day, -day, right? We have the quarterly goals. We maybe align on a monthly basis, but then... How do you maximize your time on a day-to-day -day basis? I love what Jim Rohn says. Uh, how many of you know Jim Rohn? Yeah? Jim Rohn is, uh, is an amazing teacher. One of the, uh, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago, but uh, he's an amazing teacher. You can find a lot of good material on YouTube. And he likes to say, don't start your day until you have it finished. Don't start your week until you have it finished. Don't start your month until you have it finished. There's so many founders that they sit, they go to the office and start doing stuff. Yeah, wait, man, you haven't really paid attention. What are the, the different opportunities for me to spend this day? And what are the results I want to produce? Am I clear on the targets? My friend Mark, who's a CEO, a co-founder of uh, a company in Canada, a 100-people company called T1 Agency, has a really good perspective on the topic. And I will say this, the, the only self-management program that works in the entire world, and you can read everything on self-management, is that you do a daily to-do list and at, at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day you review it. The rest is, you can either call it customizable or bullshit. I don't care what you call it. Like, you can add the rest. You can add, I, you know, I think meditation's great, software's great, tools are great. For years I looked for, remember, you know, well, you're too young to remember what a day timer is, but we used to all buy these day timers that would organize our lives and business cards and meetings. Nothing works unless you manage it. You know, software is only as good as the human work. So a daily to-do list and, you know, people will roll their eyes, but when I hear I'm overworked and I'm overwhelmed, nobody wants to hear from me. I'd love, do you mind showing me your to-do list? I don't have time to do a to-do list. Stop. Stop right there. I just love how he gets angry at the end of his top right there. <laughs> but it's true, right? It's, we're looking for the software, for the tool, for the five magic steps. And it's like, there's no magic thing you do once. You got to do things consistently. Let me give you one simple tool. There's many methods, but this one is very simple. It's part inspired by GTD and, and other productivity systems. So what you do, and many people stop here with a to-do list. By the way, we're using an example from Victoria from uh, Knowledge Gate Group. Let's give her a shout out. But uh, the first thing you want to do every single day, you want to capture things on the top of your head, put them on a piece of paper, put them on a spreadsheet in one place, in one system. And then you group them together. Oh, this is all related to sales. This is all related to the team. This is all my CEO duties, whatever. So you group everything in some kind of roles and things. But you're not done yet, right? You, you don't know why do you do what you do. What is the final result? What is the final objective? And this is the third step. You want to define the targets. This is the specific exact target. This is the result I'm after. Now that I know the result, half of the, the things that I was doing at the beginning, I was planning to do, I don't have to do them, right? What is the, the best and easiest, simplest way to achieve these results? The fourth step is kind of like when you go to a restaurant, the waiter comes and they usually say, hey, do you want to order or would you like to get a menu? Now I want to get a menu because I can see the different options and how much things are going to cost me. You don't have unlimited time. If, if I spend 45 minutes here doing this keynote, I cannot use this 45 minutes for anything else. My time is limited, so I have to be very careful what I say yes to. And I want to prioritize. I love colors, so I'll put different colors for highest priority things, and I'll try to look for leverage. Who are the people that I can delegate some of the things that I do? So I have to do it myself. When I break it down like this, it's so much easier for me to decide how to prioritize. Very important step number five, schedule things in your calendar. What doesn't get scheduled doesn't get done, right? And when you start doing this on a consistent basis, not just doing it, but including the, the last step, the book, 
Have you guys heard about the book E.Frog by Brian Tracy? It's an old book about time management. Yes. E.Frog coming from Mark Twain. Uh, it was a quote, if you have to eat a living frog, do it first thing in the morning. Right? So what are your frogs? What are the things that you always procrastinate on, on the, the heavy contract you've been not doing for, for two weeks? What if you schedule your frogs as the first thing in the morning? What if you have this conversation with the team? Hey, Michael, what are your frogs this morning? You place them right after your gym, your meditations, whatever it is for you. You eat some frogs, productivity, right? But we don't take the time to make this kind of analysis, right? So anyway, moving forward. Um, the most neglected and probably unsexy area, roles and responsibilities. How do we split up roles and responsibilities so that we're most effective as a team? So the role is obviously the title, but what are all the commitments? And are we clear what the commitments are? It's going to move on with uh, that one. And, and importantly, do we include the word passions in the conversation when we're splitting up responsibilities? Do I know what my team loves to do? Look, I, I did my bachelor in finance and my master's in finance. I know finance and budgeting. I don't really like to do it. It's okay. I'm fine. But there, there's a lot of things that I might be good at or my team might be good at, but we're not really excited about it. When you're a founder, when you're a leader of a startup, how do you keep people that are consistently underpaid? You can't pay them as much as the corporates, but you can get them on the vision. You can get them on, on we have this great team. You can get them on, I'm going to give you tasks and responsibilities that you can grow into so you love what you do. And we need to have this conversation. It's a really good tool to do that. Super simple. Probably take you two hours or one hour to, to begin this conversation. It's called Map of Responsibilities. You bring your team together. You open a spreadsheet and you say, what do you guys love to do from all the responsibilities potentially in the company? What are the things you love to do? What are the things that are, meh, it's okay. I'm kind of good at it, but I don't enjoy it so much, but it's fine. And what are the things that you hate to do? If there is a chance, I'll never do it. And you sit down and you have a conversation. Oh, Maria, you didn't like to do the, the accounting, but you've been doing it for a year. Why didn't you say anything? Well, because I'm good at it. Somebody has to do it. Okay, that, that's right. We're still small. Got to do more stuff, but maybe we should find somebody in the future. Maybe we should look into somebody so you can do more of the things that you want to do. Or I can take over that because I'm also good and I actually love to do it. But I actually, you are doing it because you didn't say anything, right? We, we start having real conversations and we split up. A very good thing you can do to complement this exercise is RACI. You guys have heard about RACI or something similar? So this creates structure. Super simple. Um, what I love about this type of conversation is accountable and responsible are two different things. There could be only one person who is accountable for a project, for a task. Right? This is the person who needs to ensure it's going to get done. But there could be many people who are responsible, right? So, so your, I don't have it here. Responsible is, maybe there are four developers that are working on the code, but I'm the project manager. I can be accountable and responsible for something, but there's only one person that, that's accountable. Consulted, this is, uh, who should I ask before I take a decision and informed? Who should I keep in the loop? Okay? Uh, so we're going back, back into the jungle. We spoke about many different things. How do we maximize our performance? How do we build a team that's sustainably good? And I want to finish up this whole conversation with a very short video. This guy here is the founder of Reebok, uh, the sneakers company. I had a pleasure to interview him also on my podcast, Productivity Mastery. And this is what he has to say when it comes to entrepreneurship. You've, you've got to be ready for the long run. 
I'm, I think now people, in fact, when they set up out in business, they always look for what is the end game, for how they can finish it and can get out. But that seems to be part of a business. I think when Jeff and I started the business is how do we make the company successful? Not how do we get out? How, what, it, what, what are our ambitions? And they were never to be uh, the number one sports brand but we did get to the number one sports brand. But that was never our initial ambition. I think initially it was, how do we make a living? How, you know, how, do, how can we sort of do better than our parents? And then you, you gain, you gain a, a little bit sort of, uh, of experience and you think, oh, we can go better. We can, and so gradually you, you get the feeling, you get the confidence that yes, we can take this further. Yes, we must take it further. It took him and his brother 20 years until they finally make it. They finally break through in America. 20 years. We got to be ready for the long run. And being ready for the long run means we need to pay attention to these things. We need to pay attention to purpose and values, effective planning, roles and responsibilities, focus and execution, optimal energy, robust communication, mental toughness. Thank you so much, guys. I hope you guys connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram. Send me a message. I'll be happy to connect. If you would like to get a copy of our book, uh, there's a special code uh, made for the audience for 20% off uh, performnow.eu slash book with a code WS2021. You can get 20% off. And of course, if you're interested into listening to these kind of topics, yes, I'm finishing now. You can go to check out my podcast on all platforms. Before that, keep performing. Thank you so much. <laughs>